Now, to eliminate confusion, all of this has nothing to do with liberal or conservative bias. According to the propaganda model, both liberal and conservative wings of the media, whatever those terms are supposed to mean, fall within the same framework of assumptions. Uh, in fact, if the system functions well, it ought to have a liberal bias, or at least appear to, because if it appears to have a liberal bias, that will serve to bound thought even more effectively. In other words, if the press is indeed adversarial and liberal and all these bad things, then how can I go beyond it? They're already so extreme in their opposition to power that to go beyond it would be to take off from the planet. So therefore, it must be that the presuppositions that are accepted in the liberal media are sacrosanct, can't go beyond them. Uh, and a well-functioning system would, in fact, have a bias of that kind. The media would then serve to say, in effect, thus far and no further. Uh, we, we ask, what would you expect of those media on just relatively uncontroversial guided free market assumptions? And when you look at them, you find a number of major factors uh, entering into determining what their products are. Uh, these are what we call the filters. So one of them, for example, is ownership. Who owns them? The major agenda-setting media, after all, what are they? As institutions in the society, what are they? Well, in the first place, they are major corporations, in fact, huge corporations. Uh, furthermore, they're integrated with and sometimes owned by even larger corporations, conglomerates, so for example, by Westinghouse and GE and so on. What I wanted to know was how specifically the elites control the media. What I mean is... I it's guess like asking, how do the elites control General Motors? Well, why isn't that a question? I mean, General Motors is an institution of the elites. They don't have to control it. They own it. You know? Except, I guess, at a certain level, I think... Um, like, I, I, I guess I work with student press, and, I, and I, so I know, like, reporters and stuff. The, the and elites don't control the student press, but I'll tell you something. You try in the student press to do anything that breaks out of conventions, and you're going to have the whole business community around here down on your neck, and the, in, the university's going to get threatened, and, you know... I mean, depend, maybe nobody will pay any attention to you. That's possible. But if you get to the point where they can, don't stop paying attention to you, the pressures will start coming. Because there are people with power. There are people who own the country, and they're not going to let the country get out of control. What do you think about that? This is the, the, the old cabal theory that, uh, that somewhere there's a, there's a room with a baize-covered desk, and there are a bunch of capitalists sitting around, and they're pulling uh, strength. These rooms don't exist. I mean, I hate to tell Noam Chomsky this. You don't, you don't, you don't share that. I think it is the most absolute rubbish I've ever heard. This is the current fashion in the universities. You know, it's patent nonsense, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a nothing but a fashion. It's a way that uh, uh, intellectuals have of, of feeling like a clergy. I mean, there has to be something wrong. is major corporations which are parts of even bigger conglomerates. Now like any other corporation, they, they have a product which they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, that is other businesses. What keeps the media functioning is not the audience. They make money from their advertisers. And remember we're talking about the elite media, so they're trying to sell uh, a good product, a product which raises advertising rates and ask your friends in the advertising industry, that means that they want to adjust their audience to the more elite and affluent audience that raises advertising rates. So what you have is institutions, corporations, big corporations, 
that are selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what point of view would you expect to come out of this? I mean, without any further assumptions, what you'd predict is that what comes out is a picture of the world, a perception of the world, that satisfies the needs and the interests and the perceptions uh, of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. Now, there are many other factors that press in the same direction. If people try to enter the system who don't have that point of view, they're likely to be excluded somewhere along the way. After all, no institution is going to happily design a mechanism to self-destruct. It's not the way institutions function. So they all work to exclude or marginalize or eliminate dissenting voices or alternative perspectives and so on because they're dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional to the institution itself. Um, do you think you've escaped the ideological indoctrination of the media and of society that you grew up in? Have I? Mm -hmm. Often not. I mean, I, when I look back and think of the things that I haven't done, that I should have done, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very, uh, uh, it's uh, not a pleasant experience. So what's the story of young Gnome in the schoolyard? Yeah, another. I mean, that was a personal thing for me. I don't know why it's interesting to anyone else, but I do remember. Well, you drew it's certain a, conclusions. Well, yeah, I mean, I, it had a big influence on me. I mean, I remember when I was about six, I guess first grade. There was, there was the standard fat kid who everybody made fun of. And uh, I remember in the schoolyard, uh, he was on a, you know, standing on a, right outside the school classroom and a bunch of kids outside sort of taunting him and, you know, so on. And one of the kids actually brought over his older brother, sort of like from third grade instead of first grade, you know, big kid. And he was going to, you know, beat him up or something. And I remember going up to stand next to him, feeling somebody ought to help him. And I did for a while, and then I got scared, and I went away, and I was very much ashamed of it afterwards, and sort of felt, uh, you know, I'm not going to do that again. That's a feeling that's stuck with me. You, you should stick with the underdog. You know? And the shame remained, you know, should have stayed there. You had already established, you were a professor at MIT, you'd made a reputation, you had a terrific career ahead of you. You decided to become a political activist. Now, here is a classic case of somebody whom the institution does not seem to have filtered out. I mean, you were a good boy up until then, were you? Um, or you'd always been a slight, some of them you were a rebel? Yeah, pretty much. I had been pretty much outside. You felt isolated. You felt out of sympathy with the prevailing currents of American life. But a lot of people do that. Suddenly, in 1964, yeah. you decide, I have to do something That's about right. this. What made you do that? Well, that was a very conscious decision and a very conscious. uncomfortable decision because I knew what the consequences would be. I was in a very favorable position. I had the kind of work I liked. We had a lively, exciting department. The field was going well. Sure. Personal life was fine. I was living in a nice place, children growing up. Everything looked perfect, and I knew I was giving it up. And at that time, remember, it was not just giving talks. I began involved right away in resistance. Uh, and I expected to spend years in jail and came very close to it. In fact, my wife went back to graduate school in part because we assumed she's going to have to support the children. Uh, these were the expectations. And I recognized that if I returned to these interests, which were the dominant interests of my own youth, uh, life would become very uncomfortable. Because I know that the United States, you don't get sent to a psychiatric prison, and they don't send a death squad after you, and so on. But there are, uh, there are definite penalties for uh, breaking the rules. So these were real decisions. Uh, and it, it simply seemed at that point that it was just hopelessly immoral not to I'm Noam Chomsky. I'm a, on the faculty at MIT, and I've been uh, getting more and more heavily involved in anti-war activities for the last few years. Something happening here. Uh, beginning with uh, uh, writing articles and making speeches and uh, speaking to congressmen and that sort of thing, and gradually getting involved more and more directly in uh, resistance activities of various sorts. I've come to the feeling myself that the most effective form of political action that uh, is open to a uh, responsible and concerned citizen at the moment is 
action that really involves direct uh, resistance, refusal to take part in what I think are war crimes to raise the uh, domestic cost of American aggression overseas through uh, non-participation and support for those who are refusing to uh, take part in particular draft resistance throughout the country. So much resistance from behind the time we stopped. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going I think that we can see quite clearly some very, very serious defects and flaws in our society, our level of culture, our institutions, which are going to have to be corrected by operating outside of the framework that is commonly accepted. I think we're going to have to find new ways of political action. People in the street singing songs and they carry inside mostly said we call our side it's time we stop hey what's that sound everybody look what's going down i rejoice in your disposition to argue the vietnam question especially when I recognize what an act of self-control this must uh, involve. It does. Sure. It really does. Sure. I mean, I think and, that this is the kind of well. issue where... Well. You know, sometimes I lose my temper. Maybe not tonight. Maybe not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, if you would, I'd smash you in the goddamn face. <laughs> 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 the, uh, <clears throat> you say, you say in your book... reason that, for not losing my temper. <laughs> <laughs> you say the war is simply an obscenity, a depraved act by weak and miserable men. Including all of us including myself, well, including then, every... That's the next sentence, the same yeah. sentence. Sure, oh, sure, 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 yeah. sure, because you count everybody in the company of the guilty. I think that's true in this uh, case. Yeah, but See, that, one of the points I was trying... This is a sense of theological observation, isn't it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because as somebody points out, if everybody's guilty of everything, then nobody's guilty of anything. No, I don't, well, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't believe that. See, yeah. I, think that, I think the point that I'm trying to make, and I think ought to be made, is that the real... Uh, at least to me, I say this elsewhere in the book, the, what seems to me... Uh, a very, in a sense, terrifying aspect of our society and other societies is the equanimity and the detachment with which sane, reasonable, sensible people mm -hmm. can observe such events. I think that's more terrifying than the occasional Hitler or LeMay or other that crops up. These people would not be able to operate were it not for the, this apathy and equanimity. And therefore, I think that it's, in some sense, the sane and reasonable and tolerant people who should who, who share a, a very serious burden of guilt that they very easily throw on the shoulders of others who seem more extreme and more violent. Twelve million pounds of confetti dropped into New York City's so-called Canyon of Heroes. Americans were officially welcoming the troops home from the Persian Gulf War. So it worked out really great for us. I mean, uh, it just goes to show that we're a mighty nation and uh, we'll be there or no matter what comes along, I mean, it's the strongest country in the world, and you got to be glad to live here. So tell me what you feel about uh, media coverage of the war. I guess it was good. It got to be a mu bit much after a while, but uh, I guess it was good to know everything, you know. I guess in Vietnam, you didn't really know a lot was going on, but here you're pretty much up to the, up to the moment on everything, so I guess it was good to be informed. <laughs>